By the way, I wanted to mention, I should have mentioned this earlier, you probably wonder where Pastor Steve and Barb Sites are. They're usually set back there, and, and uh, their, their daughter is part of a pastor family, um, Pastor Frank and Carrie Oakman, um, north, let's see, west of Indianapolis, maybe Connorsville, I, I, somewhere in that area, and Steve and Barb are up there with them right now, and then for the next month, in the month of March, he's going to be serving in uh, place of the pastor at Tell City, so they'll be gone for about a month, but he's still a faithful servant, isn't he? Still willing to go and serve where he's needed, so we're always thankful to have them, so we'll greet them back when they come. He, he made sure that his, he wanted to make sure his seats would still be here when he get, gets back. Uh, uh, he's a true Methodist. Uh, the glory of the transfiguration. Do you remember a sermon on this one? Do you remember a sermon? Maybe the children's sermon, the message of that was as good as anything this morning. It told a story, it, it touched us, and, and are you Peter, James, and John and watching what's going on? I think some reason, you know, they were going to be important to the kingdom. They were going to be vital in, in the after-resurrection, after-ascension time, and important even for us in our faith today. Think of what they wrote and, the, and what they were part of in the beginning of the church and the, the books they gave us that we can study and learn from to learn the very nature of God. And at this time, they were a little messed up. They quite, were still having trouble grasping on to, was this a, a present-day kingdom or a, a present-day uh, event that Jesus was part of and they were part of, or was it something better than that? And I think the transfiguration not only set the stage for what Jesus was about to do, but it also set the stage for what they were going to do into their future and would help us then in our future as in our present and our future. Uh, so they were, this is an important message. It's, as I told the kids, it's been, it's in three places in the gospel. And it, it is a miracle that what took place up on that, that mountaintop. And you think of it as a mountaintop experience. And I'll speak of that as we go through it. So the glory of God was shown, shown forth in the transfiguration of Jesus when he went up on that mountainside, mountainside and saw two people with him. Now, it's kind of what you see is what you get. So we, 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 know, we, we know that. It's part of, uh, let me go back to that again. What you see is what you get. And Jesus didn't want it to be uh, difficult for them. That he was, was God's son or is God's son. He wasn't it wasn't an earthly kingdom that he was set forth. And this followed an important part of, in Scripture, too. If you look at the verses right before that, the, set, the stage for this, you'll have Jesus and the twelve. They were up in Caesarea Philippi, which is a northern part of, of Israel, beautiful setting. And it's there where he asked the disciples, he was kind of getting the lay of the land, and he asked them, who do people say that I am? Think about that. Who would you say Jesus is? What is he to you? Son of God. Anything else? Savior. What? Messiah. Yeah. Come again. He will come again. Yeah. The, the, the essence of God in human form. And when he asked that, first of all, the, the, he, said, he asked who the people said, not who the disciples said that he was. And the people kind of babbled a few answers like John the Baptist. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. And uh, I think there was another one thrown in there too. Some say, you, might, you know, that uh, Jeremiah, I believe, is the other one. So they thought he was either a present day person or and John, John the Baptist had just been killed right before this too, by the way. And some thought he was a prior person come back to life. And remember Elijah, why Elijah was maybe mentioned. Elijah was just taken up. He didn't die an earthly de death. God just grabbed him up, took him home. And so there was a little bit of confusion. And then he looked at him one more time. And this is one of those times where all but Peter looked at their sandals. You ever ask a question, you weren't quite sure the answer? Don't call on me. <laughs> Don't call on me. And and Peter spoke up, I think it was, it was a Peter moment. He said, you are, you are the son, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded back, basically just praised him and said, you didn't get that from 
man, you didn't get that from me about on earth. You got that from the Father in heaven. That's where you learned that. You're beginning to get this. And then you remember what he laid on him? He said, from that time, you're not going to be known as Simon. You're going to be known as Peter, the rock, the foundation of the church. So he really laid it on Peter. And those other guys were probably thinking, oh, gosh, he's Jesus' favorite now. <laughs> but he, he did that in that moment. But then he went a bit farther as only Jesus can do, and said, but I'm going to suffer and die. And Jesus said, oh, no. Or Peter said, that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. I got your back. And Jesus, and Jesus really then kind of creamed Peter from that moment and said, get behind me, Satan. I don't think there was probably any more hurtful words could have been said to Peter at that very moment than that. You're wrong, Peter. That's, this is going to happen. You've got to get to know what I'm about. And then they move to this mountain top, and he selects Peter, James, and John to go with him up on the mountain. Now, mountaintop experiences, I, like, I read this verse to you a little while ago because it, it, mount, this particular mountaintop experience was to make sure the disciples were in tune with it, that Jesus' mission and person was completely different than what they were beginning to think. He's dying for our sins. He was going to be killed. It was going to happen. He was going to be placed on that cross. But yet he was going to be resurrected. And, and it, it's all part of his might and his power and his plan for each of us. And he would go to that mountaintop. I, I like this particular verse from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus, he is the reflection. And think about his, I don't know what picture you have of him on that mountaintop, but I see a radiance. I see a almost unable to look at radiance, but, but yet not being able to take your eyes off of him. He was that powerful. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact likeness of his being, and he holds everything together by his powerful word. And there they were on that mountain top with Jesus in the middle. The lawgiver, or the one who God gave the law to, being Moses on one hand, and on the other side being Elijah the prophet. They were able to recognize them. Moses represented a mountaintop experience, didn't he? When he went to the mountaintop, God gave him something very special. Take this down to the people, that they might live by this. That they might be conformed to my laws and my ways through the power of the Ten Commandments. And by the time Moses got back down from the mountain, they had disobeyed greatly. And then you had Elijah, good old Elijah, the prophet, who was so important as, as thought of as the greatest prophet of all. And, and, and remember how he whooped on the prophets of Baal that time. I love that story. And, and how he was so vital in carrying forth in, the, in God's message in the midst of corrupt kings and people who were always mounting a charge against him. So there they are, right there on that mountaintop with Jesus. But yet Jesus wasn't an equal with them. He, he represented, remember he said, I didn't, come, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came as a fulfillment of God's law. So he came to rep represent the law and then the word that had been given down through the years to the prophets to be given to us as humans. So he came in the middle of all that. It's the, the recognition of God's glory. And then he was transfigured into the, the, a glory and, and greatness. And, and transfigured, I'll read a moment of some words about that describes a change. Transfigured describes a change on the outside that comes from where? From the inside, doesn't it? We kind of look at baptism a bit of that same way, don't we? We... We, it's that inside that's really been cleansed and been changed with our baptism. And then we change on the outside. We kind of have a difference about us, I hope, a look of glow. I've had the privilege over the years, not just with my three children, but now as being a pastor, I've been in the uh, right after birth on a number of occasions. And I, one time, one of those occasions, I, a dad liked to squeeze everything out of me, Chris, that I could ever imagine. He was so happy. <laughs> Child was born. But when you go in and look at mom, she looks different. There's that glow. 
And that's about as close as I can come to a to think of well, an earthly person looks to that because of why, why do you think they have that? They've just given life. There's something vital in that and something important. And what's Jesus going to do on the cross and through his, his resurrection? He's going to give life. So th there's a direct correlation to that, I think. It's ex such an exciting time. And then I get to pray with them and Thanksgiving for this child. So it's always an important part. So it's a describes a change on the outside that has come from the inside. Now, this week we're going to, Many are going to do a lot of revelry in, in um, New Orleans, right? Are you going? We're probably beyond that, many of us. Not all of us, but many of us are. Never been there. But it, it, they use a lot of masquerade, don't they? A lot of masquerade. Now, the difference in it being transfigured, that's something that happens on the outside because the inside has changed. Masquerade's all on the outside. Nothing's happened on the inside. It's kind of fake. And a lot of people are masquerading out there now. And we have to be cautious. We have to be cautious in this life that we live and know that where the source of our faith is and where the source of truth is, which is in His Word, which we can be obedient to and follow and know that it's still authentic today as it ever was. So it's forever. So transfiguration versus masquerade, we're just going to concentrate on the, the transfiguration. Some words about that that think about transfiguring is, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we will all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed as Christians all your life, and that's that uh, uh, sanctification. You've been saved. You know, we... we mentioned what's a name for Jesus. One of those is Savior. So he saved us from our sins. And then through the rest of our life, this is firmly Wesleyan Methodism, we continue to be transformed the rest of our life. Continue that journey. Did anybody feel like they were fixed completely at, at our uh, baptism and our uh, re receiving of Christ in our life? Nah. Still. And that's why this is a lesson at the beginning of Lent. Because Lent is more so than giving up chocolate and Cokes. It's about being changed from the inside, transfigured from the inside. Okay, I could stop right there and probably be done. you probably say, amen, brother. Uh, got just a little bit more scripture I want to share with you. And John, because this, this is good stuff. John chapter 17, verses 22 to 24. I have given them, that, so this is something you don't even have to earn. You don't have to prove yourself for. You don't have to earn it through this lifetime. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Jesus speaking of what his father gave me. That they may be one as... This is really something. Think of Jesus and the father in oneness. And he says, you and I, we can have that too. I and them and you and me so that they may be brought to complete unity... Stop for a minute. Somebody, I, one of, I think Roger said he had this conversation with Gary yesterday. Ready to be in that oneness with God. How do you get there? Wait upon the Lord, trust in the Lord, have faith in the Lord. So that we can be ready for that. Now we want Gary still with us, but if we, and we, God gets us ready. We don't get ourselves ready. Okay, go back. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. Again, that glory point that's part of that transfiguration, that change within us. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. And God has always loved you that much before time began. That's what, remember, in Jeremiah, before you've been formed in the womb, God knew you and loved you. Here's the story. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went on the mountain to pray, a mountaintop experience. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Jesus changed. And his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, and they were talking with Jesus. Got that in your mind? They spoke about his departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So it wasn't just a casual conversation, how you doing, Jesus, you know, that kind of thing. It was 
These are words that he had just told the disciples just a short time before this. And Jesus carries on this conversation now with Moses and Elijah. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, like church. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter then said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us start a building program. <laughs> and there have been sermons preached on this, and I just don't get it. <laughs> I know it's, it's got some... It's, he wanted to memorialize the event. He wanted to... He, I think he wanted to make it a... a a memorial, a, a temporary thing, so he could go back and talk about it later. Maybe. I don't know. It would it'd have a memory. It'd be vivid. For I, I can go back and tell others about this. We build some tabernacles or some shelters, and, and we can make this an important <laughs> minute. But he, So it's going to be one for you. He said he didn't know what they were saying. That's basically it, so I don't know. We need to spill a lot of words over it. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, here's the message, guys. This is my son whom I have chosen. Would you just listen to him? I added the would you just. <laughs> when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. I think in one of the passages, if I remember right, Jesus tells them not to talk about it. I mean, as he did a few other times. There's the setting. There's the mountaintop. A lot of mountains in the Bible were important moments of Scripture. Um, uh, you can go down to any of those. Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were received. Um, the flood, where the boat, Mount Ararat, where the, the boat landed. Mount of Olives, where the crucifixion, where before his arrest, where he prayed in the Mount Olives and then ascended into heaven. There's a few other times. Mount Zion, where uh, David captures there and becomes the city of David where the temple is in Jerusalem, um, all these things, the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Tabor, Mount Carmel, uh, and then the Sermon on the Mount, all important mountaintop type experiences. So kind of bring this to close this morning, think about a mountaintop experience. Is it important? It was important for them that they might see God's glory and be able then to be changed, transformed, to go forth in what way God was choosing for them. But sometimes we want to hold on to those mountaintop experiences more than we hold on to Jesus. Been a, a common thing that I've, I've been, especially 15 or so years ago, I was very involved in Emmaus, and, and Steve Seitz had invited me to serve on Emmaus group coming up. And it's probably in the 10 to 20 years ago in that range. But I'd go to a lot of these, and I'd hear these a lot of uh, talks being given, and they were always about a mountaintop experience, but it never, it, they stayed on the mountain. We had to get down to today. Get down to where we are today. And I, we can't stay on that mountain. Jesus brought them down on the mountain because it was going to get real from that time forward with the, the crucifixion. So in the Lent, as we go forward into this, Let's look at some of the ways of being transformed. We're going to do this very quickly. If my people who call on my name will just humble themselves, that's one way to be transformed. Call on his name. Turn from our wicked ways. And this is a good for each of us and for our land as well, that he'll heal our land and our country and our nation and around the world. Romans 12, 2 is another way to do that. Don't be conformed to what the world's telling you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get into his word. Study during this time, spend some time alone with God that you might know what God's will is in His Word for your life. And the last one that I want to share, one of, no, next to the last one is 2 Corinthians 3.18. You're being transformed into the same image as He is. That's important. And the last, and we can look at transformation sometimes like the metamorphosis which is where I think trans, our, we get our word met, metamorphosis, so I read from the word transformation. Remember the caterpillar to the cocoon to the butterfly, right? And that's what's on the, birth, the, the screen now. If anyone is Christ, is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You can change 
You can turn, you can learn, you can grow during Lent. And that's my hope from you, for you, each of you. We begin that this week, or you can begin it at this moment. You begin it by trusting in Him, accepting Him, receiving in your life. Because, friends, you are a new creation. Every day, a new creation in Christ. Let's pray. God, you, you gifted us your presence on this mountain for this mountaintop experience. You showed yourself to Peter, James, and John, but you continue to reveal yourself to us through your word, your, your spirit, your truth, and through prayer. And Lord, I pray that we can come to know, come to live, come to grow, come to share that presence far greater. Part of what Corey was talking about earlier with, with who we are, with all of who we are in living out our faith. Amen.